cold. It can destroy anything living within minutes. Yet regardless of its lethal power, people, animals and plants manage to exist even in the most severe climatic conditions. The evolution has provided the living creatures with a powerful protection. The thermal regulation system able to maintain the body temperature and resist the aggressive impact of the environment. We hardly give it a thought, but the systems that allow us saving the warmth are necessary not only for the living creatures. Without them, safe and comfortable life in large cities and the work of the crucial branches of industry would be impossible. The film Heat vs. Cold will explain what those systems are and how they work. archive footage. This is how oil production looked like up until the beginning of the previous century. A bucket and a shallow well. As enviable as it is for the modern day oil industry experts, the black gold would flow right into the people's hands all by itself. Or more exactly would be splashing right under their feet. The oil would be collected right from the spots where it would show up on the surface. In 1824, the volume of oil produced in Russia amounted to 207 buckets. In 1835, 659 buckets were collected all over Russia. After processing, the kerosene fraction was used for street lightning and lightning of various industrial premises. So the demand for oil was quite big and growing. At some point, the oil collected in buckets was not enough. In 1866, the first well in Russia was drilled in the Kuban. Its depth was just 37 meters, and the oil fountain from this well lasted continuously for a whole of 24 days. Then it stopped, and the oil men drilled a little more, down to somewhat 73 meters, and the fountain came back and lasted for 28 days more. So can you imagine the difference? Here, of course, one could start talking about the industrial usage of oil, and it was a real leap towards the country's industrialization. The oil field of the 21st century. The fountains in which the happy oil men would splash are long gone. And the well depth now measures not in dozens of meters, but in kilometers. The production geography has changed as well. From the soft climate areas, it has moved to the north and the Everfrost. Our main fields are located in the West Siberia. These sites operate all year round. The temperature there falls down below minus 50 degrees centigrade in the wintertime. Getting to the oil in such conditions is just half of the process. The greatest difficulty is lifting it up to the surface, as today we mainly have to work with the so-called heavy oil, which is very cold sensitive. It has a significant content of paraffin waxes and other admixtures. All this makes it more viscous and more difficult to transport. It is harder to prepare for processing, harder to get out of the ground, and harder to transport further. Let us conduct a small experiment. Now I will clearly demonstrate what happens to oil at low temperatures. The temperature of this industrial refrigerator is minus 10 degrees centigrade. We are planning to freeze our heavy oil in here for just 10 minutes. And now let us see what has happened to our oil under the impact of low temperatures. It has turned into a jelly-like product, pretty much like broth gel. 
Pumping such oil out is next to impossible. And if we still try, this oil jelly will most likely block the well and stop the production completely. And here comes the time to remember about the saving warmth. Let us warm up our oil a bit. The heating cable that we have connected to one of the impromptu oil wells has tackled the problem in just a few minutes. The oil has warmed up and pours out of the resort without effort. This method is almost the same as the one they use to deal with low temperatures impact at oil wells. Only they do not warm up the oil, but just let it cool instead. Basically, it is warm enough in the depth of the earth and it's important not to lose this temperature. Then the task is basically not to warm up the oil, but to compensate for the heat loss into the environment. This company near Moscow manufactures 3,000 kilometers of heating cables every month. It is more than the distance from Moscow to the oil fields in West Siberia. By the way, it is exactly where some of them will travel in the near future to help the oilmen resist the severe conditions of the environment. Most often, these cables are placed right inside the oil wells. The automated control system ensures that each area receives just as much heat as it needs at this very moment. We also use special temperature gauges that monitor the required temperature on the pipe surface and signalize to the automated system in the control boxes and turn the systems on or off depending on what is needed. So now the oil is on the surface, has undergone the initial treatment and is ready to move forward. It has dozens or even hundreds of kilometers of pipes to flow through. And its temperature has to be maintained all the way through. It's a matter of ecological safety and at the same time a way to avoid large financial losses in case something goes wrong with the pipeline. Oil pumping can stop for some reason. It happens, both in cases of emergency and repair. Then the oil starts to cool. Once it starts cooling, its viscosity rises up until full freezing. If it freezes, you will no longer be able to discharge it. The threat of this is the complete destruction of the pipeline. Restoration of this process afterwards is a whole new story. Then you will have to stop the supply of, say, new portions of oil into this pipe, maybe somehow cut out this pipe and replace it with a new one, install, pump it, heat it, and then proceed to direct new supplies of oil through it. So I believe this restoration process is very difficult. In order to prevent the destruction and standstill, the reservoir parks can be built along the entire pipeline where the freezing oil can be discharged in critical situations. It is extremely costly. Another option is to discharge onto the land, meaning simply onto the ground. It will take a few decades for nature to recover after such spills. But there's a third way. Installation of special surface or skin effect heating systems within the pipeline. These are the longest heaters on Earth. Yes, imagine a water heater. While its length is about 15 to 20 centimeters. There are some longer items. A heat exchanger or a heater installed in a boiler can be about 15 meters long. And these kinds of heaters are kilometers and dozens of kilometers long. Imagine one heater that is 10 kilometers long. Such a heater consists of a pipe with a cable inside. 
It operates based on the converter principle. The current going through the cable excites the vortex currents in the pipeline itself, and it heats the oil pipeline in which it is installed when necessary. Maintaining the work of the entire industry, such global tasks as this are not so frequent for the electrical heating systems. Sometimes they play a very tiny part, but their failure may result in someone's death. The icy Arctic seas are another suitable place for recognizing the danger and the power of the cold. People started exploring this area a few centuries ago. Researchers, explorers, whale hunters, and scientists have all risked their lives to get here. And with the beginning of development of the natural resources, a new era began in these places for the shipping industry. The Kara Sea. Summertime here is difficult for the ships. The fall is risky. And the winter was considered as impossible. But here amidst the Arctic winter in 1977, a caravan consisting of the atomic ship Arctica, the icebreaker Murmansk, and the transport vessel Gizhiga are going along the route Port Murmansk, Karagate, Cape, Karasevi. There is heavy ice ahead. We have to prepare the helicopter. Take a bit to the side. Don't hit the bear. Today, the Arctic is still being explored. And even so many years later, it is still as dangerous and unpredictable. Those who have been at these seas know the North may show its severe nature at any time, and you have to be ready. For people's rescue in case of a crash, most modern vessels are equipped with special capsules with lifeboats, food, still water, and all that may be needed by the people in distress. The capsule protects the lifeboat against the environmental impact. If necessary, the capsule is thrown into the water where it opens and the lifeboat immediately starts inflating. There is only one but. Using such rescue capsules is only possible in the temperatures above negative 25 degrees centigrade, but it can be much colder in the Arctic. A combination of low temperature and humidity leads to the icing of the capsules. When vessels operate in the Arctic conditions, such capsules must be equipped with the electrical heating system to ensure that the lifeboat would inflate in the extremely low temperatures. The system consists of the heater inside the capsule tightly attached to the lifeboat and allows maintaining the temperature that can ensure that the system is working properly. If the heating systems fail or break down in case of emergency, the capsule will be ejected out into the sea, but it will not be able to open and release the lifeboat and it is made to rescue at least 20 passengers. It is not difficult to guess what happens next. In just a couple of minutes and these icy waters are deadly for human beings. modern large cities, the cold and its consequences are a problem just as topical as for the Arctic explorers and the oil well experts in West Siberia. Suffice to remember that in the highly developed 21st century, the citizens of large cities are threatened by the regular blocks of ice that can accidentally fall off roofs every winter. It's quite easy to gather these statistics. A few dozen of people die every winter season. Sometimes this number can even go up to a hundred in terms of a country. And there are many, many people that end up in hospitals over this, to say nothing of damages to property and car repairs. Hundreds and thousands of people suffer from this. This touches the life and health of basically every person. The 
community services with shovels in hand have been the only rescuers to the citizens for a long time. But in the past few years, the systems that would be able to solve the issue of icicles on the roofs have started appearing on the city roofs. I believe over a hundred thousand, hundred thousands of those have been installed on the roofs in Moscow by now. And I'm sure that many people do not even know what they are. They only see that there are two buildings. One of them is clear, no icing, no traces. And the next building over, there are guys working with their shovels on the roof. The snow and ice are falling off onto the ground and the nearby space is enclosed. Yes, it is also safe, relatively, but I'm sure that the cost of people's labor and the further roof repair, as still some mechanical damage is caused by this, they are absolutely comparable with the costs of installation of such systems. Do you notice anything? A regular roof at first glance. But when the winter comes, it will remain just as dry and clear as it is today. All because, just recently, a modern electrical heating system has been installed on it. It is usually done in the summertime to ensure you are well prepared for the cold season. The electrical heating systems are installed where there is a change of the ice forming. Those areas are usually spouting chutes, water drain pipes, valleys where two roofs are joined together. What does the system do? It melts the snow and ice, or just ensures even flow of the meltwater down on the ground through the drain pipe. The system is equipped with the temperature and rainfall gouges. It turns on and off automatically. But its main advantage is that it is able to detect how much heat it needs to produce depending on the environmental circumstances all by itself. The magical device responsible for such acumen is the self-regulating heating cable. We cannot predict in which point of the roof more snow will gather, you see. And the cable feels that there is a lot of snow at this point, but not so much in another spot. It quickly does its job, and the snow is gone. The job is done, and it all by itself reduces its energy consumption ten or six times down. Nice, isn't it? I think it's nice. It's not common for a regular heating cable to have such sensitivity. Its work principle is easy. The current flows along a metallic conductor and the heat is generated inside the conductor. This heat then warms up what we need. This process can only be stopped by disconnecting the power unit. But the self-regulating cable is much more complicated. What is a self-regulating cable? First of all, the heart of this cable is a matrix. The matrix in its turn represents two conductors through which the current flows and the plastic that covers these two conductors. In this case, the heat is produced not only in the conductors but in the special heat conducting plastic that surrounds them. This is the material with unique properties that allow the cable to adjust to the environment. Self-regulating cable doesn't overheat in the temperatures up to plus 50, 40 degrees centigrade and does not freeze in minus 40. It supports the full cycle. In plus 40, it produces small capacity, which is increased in minus. This is an example of a smart device. There is no electronics that make it smart, which normally leads to the deterioration of the effect in case of the electronics failure. And this one is based on physics. Imagine for a minute that all clothes are made of such materials that can feel whether you are cold or warm. Or your hat can feel that your ears are freezing and can warm your ears more than your head. Smart cables work where direct contact with the environment is possible. Today they protect the roofs of residential houses and most important buildings of Moscow against icing. Among such buildings are the Historical Museum, the Bolshoi Theater and the Shopping Arcade. There are very large systems in Moscow. I can give an example of the roof of the old Shopping Arcade, where several megawatts of power are consumed. It is just that the roof is very large, with a lot of glass and a huge amount of rainfall. And the roofing itself may be in danger. Imagine, the ice starts growing on such a roof. It is dangerous. It can lead to serious consequences.
by the way, according to experts, there is no danger in the electrical cable being in quite frequent contact with water. It is 100% safe. Each heating cable is equipped with a screen and an earthing scheme. In case of any emergency or an accident or a short circuit, the automatics will turn off the electricity. Nobody will get killed by the current. Moreover, all cables undergo serious checks before ending up on the city roofs. Normally, people are afraid when electrical appliances get in contact with water. In this case, we place all heating elements in water and check them, applying high voltage. We send 3,600 volts of permanent voltage to each one of them. It is several times more than our regular voltage in the power network. If the smart heated roofs are already a reality of today, can we hope, for example, for heated roads in the near future? The heated roads in Russia are pretty unlikely to appear in the near future. It is a very highly expensive technology. It requires a lot of cable and special road coverage. It is difficult to lay the heating cable just like that. A special heating cable is needed, an expensive one, and the costly systems are needed. It is a big capital investment, and if we account for how many roads we have, I believe this topic will proceed to develop, but gradually. Actually, there is no need in heating all the roads. The heating is required in specially important and dangerous areas where icing is possible. For example, the dangerous turns on mountains, serpentines, airport runways, and access ways to objects of social importance. By the way, a few words about federal objects. There are more and more heated underground passages appearing in Moscow. Though unlike the roofs, the passages are not heated with the help of smart cables. So for it to work like this, a device must be in tight contact with the environment. If there is no such contact, and there is none in the underground passages, because it lies under the pavage, and there is quite a thick layer of granite or other clad material over it, consequently, it will not be so highly sensitive. In this case, the solution is simpler. In the underground passages, the simplest heating elements are effectively used. They are laid under the top surface and equipped with the rainfall and temperature sensors. It ensures both the long service life of the pavage and the safety of people walking on it. The heat is one of the vital factors for the life and development of not only the living creatures. Smart thermal regulation systems allow developing the industry in the areas with the most severe climate and ensure the safety and comfort in their cities. We may even have no idea that they are there, but we definitely cannot do without them.